Hello everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna review one of the important circuits that was in our power amplifier module project, and that circuit is called a bias T. So bias T's are used to supply DC power to certain components that also have to output an AC signal. They are basically used to isolate the AC signal and the DC signal. So how do you design one of these circuits? I'm gonna show you how in this video. Make sure to hop into All Team Designer and follow along. We're gonna do schematics and simulation in this video. So in our power amplifier project, we had an important circuit that was placed into this PCB. If you look right here on J5, you'll see that we have a 12 volt power coming in. And then J5 is used to connect that 12 volt power to this little circuit right here with L1 and C6. And if we just check out the schematic, you'll see that circuit right here coming off of pin 21 on the power amplifier. And this circuit is called a bias T. So you'll notice here on pin 21, this is our RF output. That's where our 6.3 gigahertz signal is going to be coming from. And then it is going to pass through C6 and then eventually go to J1. Now here, we're also supplying power for this amplifier through pin 21. And so that's why we need a bias T. The bias T essentially prevents that RF output from traveling up L1 into the VDD port. It also prevents the power, which is DC, so that power being supplied by VDD from then passing through C6 and then going over here to J1. So that's the purpose of a bias T. The question is, how do we design a bias T? When I say design a bias T, how do we actually pick these different values of the inductor and the capacitor? So to do this, we need to ensure we do a couple of things. So first thing that we wanna do is we wanna make sure that by adding in this capacitor, we don't affect the input impedance looking into this transmission line. So there is an input impedance looking into this orange line from pin 21. And if we start placing these components here, so L1 and C6, we might modify that input impedance. So we wanna show that there's minimal modification of the input impedance. The next thing that we need to do is we need to ensure that there is high impedance on the L1 leg. So with having high impedance on that L1 leg, we are going to minimize the amount of signal that propagates through L1. Now in this particular design, this is really important because here, this pin header connects back to a regulator, but these two pins that are sticking off the top, if they receive this RF signal coming out of U1, there's the potential that these might radiate pretty strongly. And so of course, I would like to prevent that in this design. So that's another reason to ensure that you have a properly chosen value of L1. So the way that we do this design is we pick what's called an impedance ratio. So I'm gonna show you how to pick that impedance ratio and then how to use that to set up your values of L and C in this type of bias T. So the way to size a bias T is to first look at the value of the reactance along the inductive leg and then the capacitance along the capacitive leg. So here's our output, here's our capacitance, and then here we have our RF input into this side. So generally this is actually terminated at 50 ohms. And then generally your output is going to connect to something that's 50 ohms. So our target impedance here is going to be R equals 50 ohms, just in this example. Now, if we were connecting to directly to a load, let's say, maybe that load is, let's say, an impedance of 200 ohms, then our R would be 200 ohms. So an example of that would be like a patch antenna or an amplifier or maybe a diode, something like this. But in any case, in this example that we're dealing with, we want to connect to a resistive impedance of 50 ohms. So what we can do is we can define an impedance ratio. We'll just call it N, which is the ratio of these two impedances. And so the way to size the capacitor is to determine the capacitive reactance. And this is going to be equal to my target impedance divided by N, my ratio. Then I can do the same thing with the inductor, and that's going to be N times 
R, my target impedance. So this is my ratio, this is my target impedance. So just from this, a value for our target impedance and an arbitrarily chosen value for N, we can then size out these two reactances. So once you know the reactants, you can then go back and solve for the capacitance. So just as an example, this is going to be equal to one over omega C. So notice I left out the I here because we're just dealing with the reactants. My inductive reactance is going to be equal to, remember N times R, and that's equal to omega L. The point of using these two different equations is to set a very low impedance connection directly from this 50 ohm input and this 50 ohm output so that we don't modify the input impedance to the greatest extent possible. Similarly, we wanna make sure that we have very high impedance at our target frequency looking into the L leg. And the reason for that is of course because we want to prevent any of that RF energy from propagating up the L leg. So typical values for N are maybe as low as N equals like five or 10 all the way up to n equals 100 or even 1000. So you can have very big values for the impedance ratio, which will prevent as much energy as possible from propagating into this leg. Now, depending on the mix of components that you use, you will end up increasing the impedance ratio to a very high number. So just from looking at these different fractions, we can actually already see some important results here that we can use to then size the impedance ratio. So if we just start again with our capacitive reactants of R divided by N and our inductive reactants of R times N, if we just divide these two, we will get this relation. So N is equal to square root of the inductive reactants divided by the capacitive reactants, you get this result. N equals omega times square root of LC. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to see how the impedance ratio will scale for different values of operating frequency that we're putting in from our RF input and these two different values. You can also look at it like this. Let's suppose I start with that n equals omega times square root LC result, and I just solve for the frequency, we would get frequency equals n over two pi square root of LC. So the reason I bring this up is to say that if I want to hold my impedance ratio constant, but I increase my capacitance by let's say a factor four, I would need to decrease my operating frequency where I can use this bias T by a factor two. So this is a little scaling relation that you can use to then see what's going to happen to the impedance ratio or the frequency as you adjust these different values. To help you work through all this math, I actually created a calculator application on the Altium blog. There is a link to it in the description. Go check out that blog as it explains all of this and there's a free calculator that you can access. All you need to do is plug in your N, your target R value, and then the frequency you're operating at, and it will spit out some L and C values that you can use in a bias T. What do we wanna do here to verify this? Well, to verify this, we need to do some simulation. So let's hop into Altium Designer, and I'll show you how to do a SPICE simulation for a bias T. So to get started with a bias T simulation, what I've done is I've taken these values and I've just put them over here in this sheet. So here in this sheet, I've got a couple of different probes set up. Essentially what I'm doing right here, looking at the voltage and then the current, I'm using that current and I can then calculate the impedance at these different points. So basically across the capacitor plus this load, as well as I can just use this current and then this voltage measurement over here to calculate the output impedance of this bias T. So we can do a couple of different measurements here. The other thing that I wanna look at, and it's a little difficult to see just because there are two different probes right here, but the other thing I wanna look at is the power delivered to this load. Next thing I wanna bring up, what does this load actually represent? Here, we're connecting to a transmission line that inevitably connects somewhere to a 50 ohm load. 
So we're assuming that the transmission line and the load are matched. And that's how we designed this power amplifier originally. There's some load, which is basically the input to an SMA connector. And then that load is 50 ohm impedance. So we matched it to a 50 ohm transmission line. So the input impedance looking out of the bias T will be 50 ohms, no matter which way you cut it. So that's why I put a 50 ohm load here. All we need to do is of course, set up these probes and then go to the simulation dashboard and then we can run a transient or an AC sweep. Now, what I've done here is I've also terminated this AC source at 50 ohms because again, this power amplifier that we used in the project also has 50 ohm output impedance. So we wanna make sure that we include that in this simulation. You also have to include some resistance here or maybe a diode or a resistor up here because if you don't do that, you're gonna have a DC current loop that flows between these two power sources and you'll see an electrical rule violation in the process. Now that I have this all set up, I can click my AC sweep and we can look at the results. You see a few different curves here in these results. We see the voltages at these different nodes, we can see the current here, and then we can see the power that is being delivered to the load. So first thing we should notice is that this is a pretty wide band power delivery. The frequency spans all the way from about one megahertz all the way up to like 10 gigahertz. So it's pretty wide band. The next thing we can see here on this bottom plot is the impedances at two different points. So the purple curve is being measured from here, this node to ground. The other curve here, the light blue curve, is being measured from this node to ground. So basically right across the load. This measurement right across the load should of course be 50 ohms, just as we would expect. And that's basically being used as a comparison for the impedance looking outward across the capacitor back to ground. So let's look a bit deeper at some of these results. So first things first, if you remember some of the specs on the power amplifier and the oscillator, the oscillator is basically going to be operating at about 6.3 gigahertz. Now this amplifier, it lists in the spec as only being operating at six gigahertz. However, if you actually look at the data sheet, you will see that the operation is rated all the way up to eight gigahertz just from all of the technical data. So this thing's gonna operate just fine at 6.3 gigahertz. So we're using that as the operating frequency. And so if I go to the simulation data file and I just kind of zoom in, say on hundred megahertz, all the way up to let's say 10 gigahertz, we can start to see approximately what the power delivery to the load is at our operating frequency. Looks like about eight milliwatts. So that's our power delivery to the load and we would like to try and maximize that if we can. So in order to maximize that, we would have to adjust the values of L and C, which going back to our math, we saw that that is going to adjust the impedance ratio. So the point here is this, that impedance ratio will determine how much power you can deliver to that load at your particular operating frequency. So for this example, you know, eight milliwatts being delivered to that load at our operating frequency is not bad. You can see here that the passband maxes out at about 20 milliwatts, but we're still kind of in the edge of the passband here. So we're still gonna be able to operate this at 6.3 gigahertz and deliver power to the load just fine. It's not like we're totally cutting off power. Now let's take a look at what happens if let's say we increase the impedance ratio to let's say 10 and we have a target output impedance of 50 ohms and we're operating at 6.3 gigahertz. Well, from this calculator, you see that we should be using these values for capacitance and the inductance. So now let's put these values into our bias T that we have here in this schematic. So to do that, I just change these values and I can run the simulation again. So one thing that you would wanna do if you were actually designing this bias T and trying to optimize it for a particular frequency, you would actually wanna do a sweep. And if you do that sweep, you can start to converge on the right pair of values that gives you the optimal power delivery. But just for fun, let's just see how changing these parameters actually affects the passband. So here you can see the passband, and in this passband, you can see that we've got a little less power, but our passband has moved up to higher frequencies. So that's actually pretty good, because if we move this up to higher frequencies, we're doing a much better job of suppressing any switching noise from propagating through this VVD port all the way down through C6. 
So that's actually really important. We do want to make sure that we do that. And that's part of the reason that we use this bias T. Now remember, if VDD is the output from a switching regulator, that switching regulator is going to conduct noise and that noise could then pass onto this output. So we're also evaluating how that output noise then propagates into this circuit and then eventually into this load. So if I just zoom in once again, and we'll make this 10G, you can then see here exactly what the power delivery is. And so we can see here, it's just a little bit less. It's only five milliwatts, but here we've got a really nice wide pass band and you can see it really quickly starts to terminate at much lower frequencies. And so that'll do a really good job of attenuating any noise from getting in from that VDD rail onto our RF rail. So next, let's look at the impedances. So here you can see that the impedance diverges very quickly. And here it's measuring tera ohms of impedance from this point, so this node to ground. And that's exactly what you should see when your frequency is at 10 millihertz. So that's not surprising. But if we just zoom in here at let's say 100 megahertz to 10 gigahertz, we hit okay. We can now start to see what the impedance is right around our operating frequency. So I need to zoom this in just a little bit more. You can start to see here that when we have that slightly higher impedance ratio, we're then able to get a very good impedance match to 50 ohms right at our operating frequency. So you can see that here, right here on this point in the graph where my cursor is located. And in fact, if I just zoom in a little bit further, you can see right about here at about 6.3, we're at 50.26. So that's pretty good. Just if we wanna compute the S parameters real quick, 0.26 divided by 100.26, and then we take the log, multiply that by 20. Our S11 value at our operating frequency across this bias T would be about negative 51.7 dB. So that's really good matching. So that's exactly what we want. As you go through and iterate through these different values of L and C, you can then converge to the best mix of L and C values that gives you maximum power delivery as well as best impedance matching across this circuit. So next, what happens if we add some filtering onto the DC line in this circuit? Now, if you look at some bias T's that you buy off the shelf, like as modules, or if you look at some circuits online, you'll actually see something that kind of looks like this, where I basically have a filter circuit somewhere between my DC source and my AC section. So the circuit could look something like this. And I've only used resistors and inductors here in this example circuit, and I just kind of copied component values just as an example. But you could really see any different values for LF1 and LF2 in this circuit, as well as RF1 and RF2. You could also see capacitors in these types of circuits. But the point here is that they are adding in a set of filter circuits here to further reduce any noise from passing into the bias T, as well as to prevent uh, as much of that RF signal as possible from passing back through into the DC section. You could see these different types of filter circuits and that's perfectly fine. But the point here is that you maintain that impedance ratio looking into the inductive section of the bias T. So in this case, instead of using the inductive reactance of just the inductor to size the bias T, you're actually using the inductive reactance plus the reactance of this entire circuit in order to design the bias T. So that's a bit more of a complex problem, but just for fun, let's see what happens if we run this new type of bias T with this more complex filter. So if we run this bias T with this more complex filter, you can see here that we still get decent power delivery. We actually get pretty high power delivery up to six milliwatts, so that's not bad. And then if we look here at our impedance, we also see really good impedance matching as we would expect. We didn't modify anything on this leg of the circuit, so we would expect the impedance result to essentially be the same. But we can see here that we don't really have much of an effect on the power delivery to the load, so that's really good. That's exactly what we want. But one thing that can happen when you start adding in all of these additional inductances and possibly some capacitances in this circuit is you could have an undesired transient response. You wanna make sure that you look at the transient response and specifically the turnoff 
on in the transient response. And that turn on can be seen just by looking at the load power or the load voltage. So here I've brought up the power delivered to the load. You can see here that it oscillates a little bit before eventually converging to the steady state. So when you have that first initial turn on in this bias T from your AC signal, there will be a transient response. And that transient response could be under damped just based on all of these different components that are present in the bias T. Thanks for watching everybody. If you want to learn how to design bias T's and you want to access that free calculator to help you design bias T's, check out the link in the description. There is a blog on the Altium website that includes that free calculator. And of course, make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave your comments and questions in the comment section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator folks. Yeah.